everybody. Welcome to the Hallmarkies podcast. And we are so excited today. We are doing a bonus episode today where we are talking about one of our favorite period piece uh, television shows of the last few years. We're talking about Downton Abbey. We have a new movie coming out. And uh, so we're going to be talking about the show and the previous movie. It's going to be a lot of fun. I am film critic Rachel Wagner. And today I have with me my friend Trent from Not Your Normal Guy YouTube channel. And uh, thank you so much, Trent, for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's it's always fun to get back together with some with some friends. We just haven't done anything for a while since yeah, it kind of changed my genre. So yeah, it's, it's been a while. Cool. So what, since your first time on the podcast, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us a little about what okay. you do on your channel. Um, well, I'm Trent, or not your normal guy, theme parks, I guess. Um, I talk about theme parks, basically. So I go to Cedar Point, mostly is the, the big one for me. That's a theme park in Ohio. And uh, Kings Island, Indiana Beach, basically any Great Lakes area theme parks where I go. And basically, it's like tips and tricks on how to get the most out of your theme park day. So yeah. uh, that's that's what I do. Have you always but been? I also love movies, and that's where I started. So that's how I know Rachel because mm -hmm. of Disney movie reviews from a, a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Have you always been a big theme park uh, guy? I have been, but mostly it was like Disney. Like that was that was the big mm -hmm. one. But um, Cedar Point, growing up, that was like the local park. So that was my Disney World when I couldn't afford to go to Disney World. So yeah, yeah. So yeah, it, it, it's kind of just been a natural transition for me. So yeah, it's cool. Yeah, my favorite growing up, I mean, of course, I love Disneyland, but I I went uh, as a middle school and high schooler to Kings Dominion in, uh, yes. in Virginia. And Kings, oh. Kings Island is real, real similar. Like okay. the, a lot of similar rides um mm -hmm. very similar concept yeah yeah uh and they're they're both they are very like like they took the same like spoken wheel idea as disneyland and they uh, they just did their own thing with it and it was all about movies and all because they were owned by paramount pictures when they were started so mm -hmm. yeah because the thing with disneyland is that and, and not as much disney world but disneyland doesn't really have roller coasters I mean, the most you get is Thunder Thunder Mountain or yeah. uh, I mean, Space Mountain. Disney World, it's it's almost the same thing too. It's mm. not as many, and, and that's where these parks are different. You know, they're more roller coaster heavy. But yeah, yeah. I mean, you got Big Thunder Mountain Railroad and uh, like Seven Dwarfs Mine Train, and but they're small. You know, they're not like huge thrills. You don't go to Disney for the thrills. You go to Disney for the for the theming. But yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know. I love the dark rides at Disneyland. Yeah. I haven't been to Disney World since I was twelve, so I, okay. I'm more of a Disneyland land girl. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've been to Disneyland Disneyland one time, and mm -hmm. it was in college, so not not as much. <laughs> We're kind of opposite that way. Mm -hmm. But you're you're more West Coast yeah. than I am. I'm more East Coast, so that makes sense. Yeah, I I live in in Utah, so that makes yeah. more sense to go to to disneyland uh, yeah but, uh, but it's such a fun way to to spend a holiday because everything's so clean and uh it's just, oh yeah i mean it can be stressful in its own way but it's also pretty stress-free in the sense of planning your day it's just all there and you just enjoy and and you don't have to to you know worry about coordinating everything and it's, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's great. I love it. I'm really excited. I'm going back to Disneyland in September. I'm going to go to D23, which is uh, okay. always a highlight. And it's been yeah, three years. I've always wanted to go to that. Maybe I will someday. I, yeah, I every... love you're, you're a big Broadway kind of a person too, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. So, huge. so like with, with Broadway, like Disneyland or Disney World either way like you're you're getting all kinds of shows oh, and yeah. like like you you they're many you know but they're still it's a fun thing mm -hmm. to do too so no they do that's true they have the uh the shows uh the uh, uh throughout I mean like the Aladdin show that they had for so long was great in Disneyland uh oh. and 
I'm trying to think the other ones that in Disneyland, but there were, there's always some really good shows. Yeah. I mean, they, they always do a good job with making this fun stuff. Have you been mm-hmm. recently? Yeah, I went uh, this last, uh, actually on Christmas day night, I went. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I did a Disneyland trip for four days. It was really okay. Fun. That's awesome. That was my reward for watching all the Christmas movies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that that is a reward because you <laughs> you went through like it was like how many Disney movies or I mean sorry Christmas movies did yeah. you watch? I watched I and reviewed them on my feed over and over. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I watched and reviewed 125 new Christmas movies. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even believe the 125 <laughs> new Christmas movies were made. In and I didn't even watch all of them. There were like 183 <laughs> or something like that. Jesus. Oh, my <laughs> word. Bonkers. I know. <laughs> you are always on the grind, Rachel. <laughs> oh, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I've never been as much of a television person as a movie person. And then all of a sudden this year, I'm all of a sudden television person. Oh, I, yeah. I'm doing regular recaps of Heartland and Sex in the City and One Calls the Heart. So I don't know what's happening. It's bonkers. <laughs> I've always liked television more because you can, I'm really big on character development. So mm-hmm. anytime you have a television program, you can take more time to develop the mm-hmm. characters and see them change and stuff like that. So I love that. That's yeah. part of the reason why Downton Abbey like really appealed to me too. So yeah, yeah, I mean, I like that, but then I also don't really trust them to do a good job with it, and so so like I kind of agree because you like, end up with How I Met Your Mother, where my they broke my heart into a million pieces, and I. <laughs> So See, I don't hate the ending to How I Met Your Mother, but was, I think a lot of people do. It was so bad. I hated it so much. <laughs> I I like it when you see the characters change a little bit. The mm-hmm. problem is sometimes you do have like like The Office where they like change, but they almost dilute the characters a little bit more. Yeah, um, that's they what I of, noticed toward the end of that. So yeah, uh, yeah, kind sometimes. Of, they can kind of flanderize the characters and have yeah. them become one note. Uh, but I have to say that's not the case with Downton Abbey. And no. I think that it is an incredibly consistent show. I mean, it, it, there was really only one thing we'll talk about it that they did that, that I didn't like, which was with Matthew's, with how they handled Matthew Crowley's death. It was tough. But I, again, they, they had a tough situation. So what are they going to do? But I still hated it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know everything about the situation, but I'll be interested in talking about yeah. why or, or, you know, my take mm-hmm. on that character's death and what happened yeah. with it. And all so that. overall, what do you think is your appeal of what do you, overall, what do you think is the appeal of Downton Abbey? What's your favorite part about the show? I think the appeal is just that we live in a world that's constantly been changing over the last, you know, like I I watched this over COVID. So like Mm -hmm. at that point, everything had changed. And so it was just like, oh my word. Like (laughs) then I get this, I find this show and I'm, I'm watching it. And I just was like, I, I delved really far into it because it was just like, I feel like I identify with these characters, you know, like that, the same kind of change that happened um, that I noticed is the same kind of change that had happened to, to these characters, you know, um, even down to like Black Lives Matter um, protests and stuff like that, and, you know, grappling with that kind of stuff. And you saw people grappling with protests during the show, there were wars, there were, you know, like it was just like I, I kept watching it with my family and it was like, we've we've gone through this kind of stuff like we're we're watching the same kind of thing happen and then you of course see everybody's different takes on the political situations within their own families you know and uh, again same thing you know in my own family there are so many different people that have so many different ways that they think about these things so it was it was fascinating to me I loved I loved that so that, I think yeah. that's the overall appeal well, and it is so well made, so well acted. 
-hmm. And I, I think there is something very escapism about the, about costume dramas and the rules of this, in this case, the Edwardian era Mm -hmm. of uh, how they were supposed to live and how they were supposed to uh, dress and how they're supposed to interact with the staff and the staff is supposed to interact with the family and and how particularly in this era how all of that was changing so mm-hmm. they're being forced to kind of evolve and adapt and uh that i think is just fascinating and also like i said escape there's an escapist quality to it yeah i but i mean think about how much things have changed with us like we're doing a zoom call meeting right now mm-hmm. and we're working while not you know like dressed in our normal clothes we don't have to get in a suit and tie like my dad did going into work you know like there's just there's so much that's changed about our world and uh you know now so many automated things that are happening too and i mean it it all affects the way the world works so i i love it the 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 social implications of of the show is fascinating to me but like you said it's so well acted um the the scripting is incredible um there were so many times when it was just like i'd hear my dad downstairs being like how did they come up with this (laughs) to to write Mm -hmm. this kind of a story like um and he doesn't normally get into tv shows like this either so or like that either so it was you know it's it's really well made we'd like to take a second and thank our sponsor for this episode of the podcast Bethany House Publishers and Becky Wade's newest release, Turn to Me. Summer is the perfect time for romance and Becky Wade's contemporary romances always deliver. Her compelling Misty River romance series is set in the picturesque Blue Ridge Mountains and follows the love stories of friends bound by a life-changing event. The perfect combination of intrigue, romance, and wit. This is a series you will not want to put down. Get 40% off and free shipping at bakerbookhouse.com. When you purchase any of the Misty River Romance novels with the promo code MistyRiver40. That's bakerbookhouse.com and code MistyRiver40. Well, we're going to talk about each of the family members and okay. and then we'll talk about this the downstairs staff. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about the previous movie that we had. So we start out, of course, there's Robert Crowley uh, played by Hugh Bonneville. And I think that he does such a good job in this role. He's very endearing, but he's also very frustrating, especially whenever he has to make any kind of business decision. You're just like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you're just like just let just let tom or or mary or somebody else make the decisions you make terrible choices (laughs) he's he is such a traditionalist and i think i find him fascinating in that way Uh, uh, every single every single person in the in, in the show you know has their like their traditional moments but then they like have these breakout moments too where they change and he's one character that i feel like changes quite a bit thinking like nothing can change a lot of times and stuff like that uh but then he he changes his opinion uh throughout the the series and that's pretty interesting to me yeah he's old school and he helps matthew uh, mm-hmm. in the early seasons to try to explain to him why Matthew needs to have a valet, why he needs to get help, yep. uh, you know, dressing and things like that. And, and he, he values the, uh, the uh, ways of uh, that, that the house is the Downton is, is about supporting the whole community, not just about themselves as a family. Yep. I love how his, his involvement there too, with, with Matthew, uh, makes me it always makes me happy watching it because he's mm-hmm. basically giving more dignity to someone who you know Matthew kind of looks down on and acts like well that's kind of a dumb job for an adult to have you know but uh, but really like uh, Mr. Crowley helps helps him to see that it's it's not dumb there's still dignity in his job you know and I, I like that a lot. Uh, so then we have Cora Crowley, who is the wife of 
uh, of Robert Crowley, uh, played by Elizabeth McGovern, and she is American. And I really love her character. I think that she is sweet and funny, and uh, we get some emotion in her throughout the course of the seasons when she has the miscarriage. That's one of the toughest part of uh, a moment for her character, I would say. I yeah, I would definitely say that's one of the one of the toughest ones. There's also that like rift between the relationship of her and her husband. Mm-hmm. Uh, doesn't he cheat on her or something like that at one point? She thinks that I don't think he goes. I can't remember actually. I, I don't think he either. goes all the it's way with it. I think he gets close. I can't remember. That's okay. right. But that there, was a there's while. That. Yeah, there's there's that rift where you watch husband and That's wife right, I forgot apart about that. and then kind of come back together again. Mm-hmm. And that was a that was an interesting uh, moment for me too, yeah. watching that because at the time, I mean, it, it it's, it's always going to come back well, down to like some ups- sort of social. She's upset with him because he refused to call the doctor with Sybil, and then Sybil passed away, yeah. so she blames him. Yeah. And I forgot, totally forgot about that plot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, there are so many plots. Yeah. Though, you know, and what sticks out to you is probably going to say a lot about, yeah. you know, like what, what you think about a lot, you know? That's true. I mean, I just, I love in the movie when Edith is struggling and she, she's so sweet. Cora is so sweet with her daughters. So loving. And uh, she, Edith doesn't want her husband to leave when she's just about to have, when she's going to have a baby. And uh, she, she tells her mother and, and then her mother says, uh, your father talked to, or Bertie talked to the King. I talked to the queen. <laughs> that was good. I like that. But uh, even down to when Edith has her, uh, her baby uh, right. out of wedlock mm-hmm. and then she can't have the baby there all of that first of all you see a lot of times when Cora has that like bite to her too right um, same thing with with Mary when Mary has sex with someone outside of marriage you know and uh, brings someone into her bed and all that kind of stuff and then you see this bite from Cora but at the same time then she's always there like protecting and loving her kids um I find that fascinating too um yeah. just because there there is always there's a lot of complexity to to all these characters but she has a lot of complexity to her yeah and that's the thing about the show is because everything is changing and all the rules are changing that it's not as kind of uh it's not as bland i guess as you'd think like these characters are always being forced to kind of reevaluate their their situation oh, yeah. in their life no. And what matters yeah um, and that that ends up making for some interesting uh times when mm-hmm. all of a sudden some established trope of the way that you expect you know x yeah. character to react they don't react that way anymore um even though it seems like it's been very well established that they surely will do this and then all of a sudden they change their their viewpoint yeah it's it's fascinating so well let's talk about Probably the, the, I guess you, if you can say breakout star of the show would be Maggie Smith as Violet Crowley. Of course. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not that she was a breakout care. I mean, a star, you know, like she, she's been around for forever. Yeah. But, yeah. And I think nobody has played an old woman longer than Maggie Smith. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> because if you think about, she was in Hook playing, yeah. the, playing Wendy in that. Hook. And that was in what, like 95, 94, <laughs> something like that. I was a little, little kid yeah. at the time. Yeah. Yeah. She, and she looked like an old lady then. <laughs> yeah. She looked the same as she looks now. I mean, yeah. if I age as well as Maggie Smith, I'll be very, very happy. But yeah, I mean, she's, she's the one when I said like they changed their, their opinions she's really the one i was thinking about is maggie smith because she's she's one that you never can pin down and i think that's literally the way like the writers want her to be seen is just like 
she never wants to be predictable. She will come up with another way to to attack an, an issue. And you see that in the movie also um, with the way that she responds to, to some stuff too. We'll, we'll get into that later. Well, and she has so many great quotes throughout the oh. course of the series that yeah. are hilarious. <laughs> I, I mean, I always, one of my favorites, when she's like, what's a weekend? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but she acts like she makes me think of out of touch celebrities to some degree yeah. um where like some celebrity will think it's just completely and totally normal to to live their very privileged life and everybody understands this kind of thing and then uh it's the same thing with with her she'll She'll act like, oh, yeah, everybody understands this. This is just the English way. You know, there, there is no other way to do this. And then, uh, but people will be like, no, like th there's a whole different world out there that you know nothing about, you know. Uh, but she is also someone who learns a lot about the world throughout the course of the series. And she has a lot of things that, that she changes. Plus, family is like in, of utmost importance to her. So. Um, even after she uh, finds out about some of like Lady Mary's indiscretions, she's still uh, kind to her because she's family. She has the trump card, you know, so I, I like that. Yeah, because she's not unreasonable. She's no. not like a, a I mean, sometimes overbearing. She is, but overall, she isn't. Yeah, yeah. she's not like, <laughs> like she's she is opinionated and strong, but there's always uh there's always love of family there with her and there's always sort of a uh a humor to her that i think makes it so she's not she's not like a scrooge kind of character yeah yeah and i like don't be a defeatist dear it's very middle class <laughs> <laughs> i like it that you have quotes memorized there yeah. i always just like the witty banter between her and Vi violet i think is that right uh well uh, so her name is violet and then isabel sorry isabel yeah. okay i couldn't remember the name yeah so um, we can talk about her so she is played by penelope penelope uh, uh she is played by penelope wilton uh who's great and they are so fabulous together the two of them bantering their chemistry is awesome yeah it's mm -hmm. so cool and in the movie there is uh a controversy behind uh a relative named maud played by uh, melda staunton and uh, she's talking to uh and isabel is talking to penelope and she says, no, you need to tell, you need to tell her the truth because once she knows and she knows there's a reason she will, yeah. she will lay off. She will. Yeah. And so that kind of understanding between the two of them and animosity between the two of them really works so well. Well, even it, throughout the movie, uh, they initially seem like they are on two completely different sides. Mm -hmm. um, but then they join forces as the movie continues uh, because really they're just trying to find answers, you know, and yeah. both of them are trying to find answers. But then I would say generally is, is it Isabel? Yeah, Isabel. Okay. Isabel is more, uh, more reasonable. Usually like I, I usually look at her and well, think she's more reasonable. She's more modern. Certainly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And she's usually, she has some kind of, uh, rallying cry or pulp you know pulpit that she's beating whereas yeah. whereas it, none of that really matters that much to violet because all that matters is the family in downton yeah at one point they're talking about how things are changing in the movie and uh you know the the royal family's coming and she gives out all these like cliches about something and uh <laughs> the uh, Maggie Smith's character says something about, will you have enough cliches to get you through the entire day? And, yeah. <laughs> and she says, uh, well, if I, if I, if I lose the cliches, then I'll just come to you for them or something like that. I, I, they're so much yeah. wittier than I am, but I love it. 
Well, and when you have, I think both of these actresses are da- like dames in the in the yeah. British, you know, court. They're like legends actresses, and yeah. uh, and so when you have that kind of talent in uh, in the show, I mean, it just makes for good, you know, an entertaining show. Good writing as well, of course. Uh, yeah. But yeah, their their dynamic is is probably my favorite. I I completely agree. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay so then we have mary crowley and uh, she's the oldest daughter and i played by michelle dockery and i think that michelle does such a great job of making making mary kind of prickly and kind of opinionated and difficult particularly when it comes to anything with edith but still managing to somehow make her likable Okay, say say which one this was again. Which for, which for Mary, what, say the oldest again. daughter, Mary. Oh, we are talking about Mary. Yeah, yeah, the oldest. Okay, sorry, yeah. I thought you were no, you're saying. Fine. Okay, yeah, no, uh, the actress, yeah, she makes her very prickly, and she's probably the worst character <laughs> in the movie. Like, there's there's so much where I think she's despicable, and yet I feel like I see myself in her. If that makes sense. Like, I feel like we're all a little bit selfish and I feel like she's frequently selfish. And yet there's something that I look at her and I, I identify with her, if that makes sense. So I I like how she's kind of that. I don't want to say anti-hero, but she's kind of that, like morally ambiguous character um for for the movie or for for the show just all together the movie i actually think she softened a little bit but yeah well i mean she just has those moments of connection with someone like tom or of course her the romance with matthew uh, i think it helps a lot so that helps us to root for her she's a very complex character i would say absolutely and her Mm -hmm. her romance with um with Matthew makes her a better person too. Yeah. Um, but after Matthew dies, it's almost like she becomes very nihilist at the end of the show. And you see a lot of this like very dark, um, very dark feelings from her. Um, and yet again, I still didn't stop like rooting for her <laughs> even well, through I mean, the end. You understand. It. I mean, because absolutely she, she is having to deal with, should they keep, the the house going uh Mm -hmm. other people are packing up which was true at the time and people were closing up their uh service was becoming less of a thing things were changing and so it's it's understandable that she's going to be wondering kind of what to do i mean i think her most difficult uh most unlikable trait is her relationship with edith and how hard she is on her sister (laughs) Absolutely. It's tough. I agree. Uh, But at the same time, I see that same bite and wit from Edith toward her too. And maybe, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg? We don't know, Mm -hmm. you know, which one really, really bit first or the hardest, but they're, they're not kind to each other, like at all. Um, (laughs) Her relationship with her grandma is really great. Her relationship with her mom is great. I don't, I think that she's a very interesting, interesting character. Absolutely. Yeah. And she uh, holds, I, I do kind of feel like she holds the series together. Yeah. Um, like if it wasn't for Mary and it, you kind of see a generational thing and they touch on this in the movie also where um, you see Lady Mary as becoming the, uh, the old lady Grantham kind of a kind of a person like she's going to be that role that's going to hold the family together and keep everyone there and that's why she has to be that tough as nails kind of character too yeah so then we have edith uh played by laura carmichael there's sybil who uh passes away giving birth and has a uh relationship with uh tom branson we'll talk about that a little bit but uh, but we have Edith and I think that Edith is overall a pretty good character. I do feel like they spent too long on the whole Marigold 
uh, her being with the other family and, uh, and her relationship with the, that, um, with the Marigold's father, all that wasn't that interesting to me. I don't know. It felt like a little, I, I have, I have an opposite opinion. Oh, really? <laughs> but partly it's because my family, my, uh, it's like my great grandma had a, had a child who she hid away from her. Oh, really? Uh, of course, she wasn't like a lady or anything like that. But um, so it, it, like, I've seen some of the fallout of that in my own family. But then to see, uh, also probably having my own daughter too and watching um, with with my divorce and stuff like that, watching uh, her kind of be more distant from me too. That whole like watching a, a little girl who, you know, is taken away from someone who has become their family, you know, all because of really difficult life circumstances at the time that you just can't really... Um, like in our modern society, it's hard to relate to, you know, like I, I understand why it would be difficult to watch, you know, like where, where you wouldn't really connect with it that much because you just look at it and be like, why would anybody do anything like that? But at the time you would feel like that was the only option. Um, even for me watching it, I kept saying stuff to my mom about like, why would the family not just, I mean, the family could just say, no, we're not, we're not, we're going to accept this baby into our, um, into our family, which is kind of what they do later on in like a mitigated kind of a way, but they, but it, it, it I don't know. It, there's just so many cultural complexities at the yeah. time. So, but that whole story arc was just heartbreaking to me watching it you know it takes so. a long time i mean marigold's pretty old she's what three or four or something yeah. like that well and she's basically lived with this other family for that for part of that time and you mm -hmm. know just to and, and she's never been told that she wasn't her daughter and in that in that amount of time you as the mother or as the father of that child, you fall in love with that baby. That baby is yours, you know? So it's just um, with these adoptive parents, you know, it just, it just shows so many heart wrenching complexities, you know? So that, that was, that was part of it for me. So, yeah. yeah. So then the last family member we'll talk about is Tom Branson played by Alan Leach. And he is, was the chauffeur and he and Sybil uh, have a relationship. They end up getting married. It's big scandal. Uh, and uh, that was a lot of fun. Of course, she ended up wanting to leave the show. And so they had, they killed her off. I, I like how they killed I know her she off to better leave the than show. I like. Yeah, I think so. That's why. <laughs> Okay. I she, yeah, I think she wanted to leave the show. I don't know anything about the backstory either, though. I'm pretty so sure. I'm pretty sure okay. that she asked to to leave the show. And same thing with with um Matthew. Matthew. Um, yeah. I, I just what's his name? I forgot. All of a sudden, Dan He's Stevens. The Beast. Same with Dan yeah, Stevens. Dan Stevens. <laughs> yeah. You wanted to leave the show, and so that was their solutions for it. But, uh, but I, I really like Tom as a character and he's kind of a, uh, a revolutionary a rebellious in the sense of his political views, but he loves his family. He loves the Crawley family and he learns to kind of, uh, to still be truthful to his ideas, but to, to count family first. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I like that too. I like how the, the revolutionary plot, um, mm -hmm. that's where I am right now in the series. So I'm rewatching the series right now. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> it's, it's fascinating how like he, you know, Sybil is getting more into the whole like going to see these demonstrations and stuff oh, yeah. like that. And he's really the one trying to pull her back and be like, no, 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 not a good idea because he knows their family. So you can see his, his change, you know, fairly quickly because he does care about their family, even though he, um, 
kind of is kind of exists in a little bit of opposition of what their family represents overall. And I, I really love his relationship with Mary. I think they have a really brother sister type relationship mm-hmm. that I find very endearing. And uh, I, I even like his relationship with, with Violet, just the whole family. Yeah. I, I think he's, he's a, and he's a good character to signify the way the world is changing yeah, at the yeah. time. And, well, and he also, because he was downstairs, he can relate to both upstairs and downstairs. Yeah. He's almost like a, like a point of almost like an audience view kind of a character. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Cause we can see, uh, we can see the world through his eyes a bit better because we understand what it's like to be both the service people and both and privileged people a lot of times in our society. So uh, we can, we can kind of relate to him on that level of being in both camps. We'd like to take a second from this episode of the podcast to celebrate our sponsor of this episode. And that is the Hallmarkies Patreon. Do you love Hallmarkies podcast? Do you want an inside scoop into what happens on the podcast? Do you want early access to episodes and loads of cool perks? Now is the time to become a patron of Hallmarkies podcast. By becoming a patron, you get to access our patron Facebook group. You can request episodes or even be a guest on the podcast. And most importantly, any patron can join our monthly movie watch alongs with stars like Paul Campbell, Natalie Hall, and more. It's as low as $2 a month to join in and become a special part of the Hallmarkies family. Please consider, and we will love you forever. Go to patreon.com slash Hallmarkies. That's patreon.com slash hallmarkies. About the downstairs, the staff, uh, we have Carson played by Jim Carter. He's the butler. And so he's uh, kind of like the CEO of the downstairs staff. Mm -hmm. Uh, He keeps everything going smoothly. uh, And he has a good relationship, particularly with Mary. Uh, I always love a, a good Mary and Carson scene. Yes, I do too. There's just such a, there's such a kindness to him and this the same kindness that he bestows on mary i also see him bestow on um his future wife too um the the other like head hughes yeah yeah mrs hughes um but they he is he is like the ultimate traditionalist in watching this show so i love how he is all about um, you know, the decorum and making sure everything is perfect. And how are we going to do this kind of stuff without, you know, an extra manservant or things like that? Like, I don't even know all the right words, but um, it, it's just he anytime anything changes, even just a tiny amount, you know, a coat color changes a little bit or anything. There's it, he he is the one to like really have a freak out moment about those tiny changes he's probably more of a traditionalist even than violet absolutely yeah 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 uh so, so we, and which we, which makes the movie interesting yeah. when he goes into rebellion <laughs> i love that yeah oh yeah i love that too <laughs> um and so we have mrs hughes who ends up marrying carson uh, she's the housekeeper and so she's in charge of all of the ladies may lady maids and basically kind of these uh the co-CEO of the, of running the, the downstairs. And I love her. I love Phyllis Logan playing Mrs. Hughes. I think she's really great. Another, I think she's a dame. I think Don't hold me on that, but anyway, the, <laughs> she's certainly worthy of it. And yeah. I love their chemistry, uh, Carson and Mrs. Hughes. And I love, uh, her interactions with Daisy and Mrs. Patmore and yeah. all of that. If there's anyone in this show that I like, uh, like really, really like, and would want to like get to know in real life, it'd be Mrs. Hughes. She's she's the sweetest, the sweetest woman, I think. And even watching her little like minor dating exploits throughout the series um, mm-hmm. makes it really interesting. That's true. Too. Yeah. yeah, it's fun watching her develop a little <laughs> bit. Uh, so then we have uh, Brendan Coyle playing Bates and he starts out 
uh, he was a friend of of uh, Mr. Um, Crowley uh, from the military. And so he gets this chance to work in Downton as the valet, uh, but he uh, has, uh, he walks with a, a cane. And so he struggles at first and that's kind of his plot. I, I could have done without the whole plot of him going to prison and the, that felt extremely stretched out and was just not that interesting to me. In this case, I I think I agree. Um, I, I liked, I, I understood that he, I, I don't know. I, I agree. I agree. It was too, too much of a, like it, like it felt like they just wanted to find a reason to keep him like constantly in this like state of I don't like, can we will we won't we like he and yeah. his his uh, I I forget her name right now um, well, the Anna. The girl here. Anna yeah so he and Anna have this relationship and of course they want to be together but it's like they'd hit every possible obstacle and I just wanted to see some happiness from them um Mm -hmm. instead of this constant angst about whether they could uh, you know be together things like that because they'd already overcome so much it was time for some like just just watching them be yeah it was just it was just too stretched out the whole i think it went for like several seasons and by the time you're just like come on let's just be done with this yeah Uh, (laughs) But just I just get married already. You've already yeah, dealt with your ex-wife and you've already dealt with. Yeah. Uh, but I, I really Benny. like Brendan Coyle's performance. I think he is very warm. Absolutely. And- yeah. Mm-hmm. They're, they're, he's a very kind man. Um, I love the amount of patience that he has, um, both with the people he works for and um, with the people he like gets to know better. Um, but yeah, mm-hmm. it's, it's definitely a, a slow, but yeah, there's, there's just a lot of, a lot of obstacles that he has to encounter. So I do think that he and Joanne Froggett who plays Anna have nice chemistry. Absolutely. Too. Yeah. And she has the most emotional and next to maybe Edith storyline with, uh, I mean, those, the, those two plots are, are kind of the biggest emotional yeah. storylines of the series but when she gets raped i think yeah. i forget which season it's in but that is definitely a tough a tough story arc and she i think she acts the heck out of those scenes absolutely well. yeah that's that's one of the worst most gut-wrenching parts so for me the two really big gut-wrenching parts were uh when the when lady edith when <laughs> when lady edith's child um when she just takes her away from the other family and it's got wrenching because I see, you know, both sides of how much you would love the child. Yeah. But then, um, when, when you have, um, Anna's scene where she is assaulted, yeah. um, it was just horrible. Um, but then, yeah. then I also just, it continued for so long too. And I just wanted to like scream at the TV, like he loves you, you know, like stop, yeah, stop it with because he's she's just pushing him away constantly mm-hmm. because of the trauma she experienced. But it is something very true to life, and at that point, it would have been even more. You know, it shows how much our society has changed that that kind of thing isn't as much of the like horrible stigma against the woman as it was then you know it still is a little bit when unfortunately but. seen as unworthy which is what she felt exactly yeah at the time and that's uh, well, that's why it was so heart-wrenching yeah. because it was just like you are there's no more worthy woman than you mm-hmm. <laughs> like just <laughs> he is not gonna not love you you know and it just it just hurt to watch so yeah yeah so then we have daisy she's the uh, one of the maids and her big kind of plot line or biggest falling is when she ends up getting married to this uh 
man in service. I forget his name, but uh, that's that's passing away. Um, she marries him to make him happy, and that and whole that whole plot line. Kind of to make his dad happy, mm-hmm. also. And yeah, that's I actually forgot about that until you just mentioned it, but. <laughs> Okay, I, okay, this is where I'm gonna admit my minor annoyances. She annoys the crap out of me through this whole show. I just every time, even in the movie, there's just a lot of moments from like, man, can you whine anymore about <laughs> like everything? So, yeah, poor Andy gets fit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just like, yeah, because then in the movie, uh, she's she's with. It, that that's Andy, right? Mm-hmm. That she was with. Them. Yeah, I, I yeah. do like her dynamic with Miss Patmore. I think that's absolutely fun. And and even when she annoys me, that doesn't mean I don't like. Yeah, her in the series, like she adds a ton to the series. Mm-hmm. She adds some comedy. She yeah. makes it fun, and she's she does a great job of acting it. And I'm not saying there aren't people in the world who act like her. So there absolutely are. Um, and that's part of the fun is the variety of characters and the way they all act. And yeah, but she's definitely one where she's always angsty about wanting another man but she never chooses the man who likes her and you just see it right in front of her and you're like come on <laughs> this guy likes you and he's yeah. a great guy but you you only want what you can't have it's actually kind of relatable <laughs> i got a bit so. <laughs> it's uh and played by sophie mcshira is her name and mm-hmm. i think she she does a a really good job with daisy she's I agree. very funny and uh, sweet and uh so she's a, a uh the she's the widow of william mason that's the, the name william is the name yes yeah okay then we have mrs patmore who is played by leslie nicole and she's the chef she's the cook and uh she she's she's a lot of fun i yeah. like her mm-hmm. she's another one that i I really want that. Like I would want to meet her in real mm-hmm. life and talk with her because yeah. she, I think she is very fun. I like her bite. Um, I like how at the beginning she's very mean to Daisy. Um, and then as you watch the series, you realize it's because she can't see and she kind of needs a scapegoat, someone who she can kind of uh, blame for her own issues at the very beginning of the series. And after they realize some of the issues with her like going blind and things like that um she oh, yeah, becomes about that. softer yeah she becomes softer toward daisy after mm-hmm. that so this is on my second rewatch that i realized that i didn't want yeah. realize it during the first one but um so then their relationship becomes it's still kind of a like do it right daisy you know that kind of thing but it's not a it's not as much of a like you idiot do it the way i told you to or um, constantly blaming Daisy for anything that goes wrong in the kitchen kind of a situation anymore. So, um, so then we have Thomas, who is the, uh, I don't know what his actual role is. I mean, by the end, he's the butler. Um, what do they call it? The um, footman. He's a footman. Yeah. It's a start. And uh, he he wants to be made the the butler uh at first i felt like he was kind of a cliche you kind of have this sort of repressed angry gay character that's kind of a villain i don't know to me that was a little bit grown worthy but i felt like once o'brien left because the two of them were kind of uh in the beginning were kind of working together and were uh, yeah. kind of villainous together once she left, then I felt like they started to kind of build up his character more and make him more empathetic. And I love in the movie when he says to Ellis, he says, do you think that uh, they'll ever come the, around? The world will ever come around. Yeah, yeah, that was a really nice moment, I thought. I noticed that too. Uh, yeah, I I find his character very interesting. Um, and I do kind of like the despicable duplicitous nature of him initially um especially 
how O'Brien takes gets it out of him, but I think you can almost read it as O'Brien is in a way using him to some degree. Yeah. Also at the time, I mean, to be a gay man at that point, <laughs> you would have had to have had some willingness to, um, to be duplicitous, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I think, I think there may be some, some reason for that. Um, but anyway, like, I, I think it's a, it's a fascinating read on his character. And then he slowly turns into a, a very uh, different. I mean, by the end, uh, I am really character. emotionally connected with him. I think that yeah. they do a good job. Whereas I just feel like he's kind of one note at the beginning. Yeah. And then you really do grow to, to care about his character. Well, even, even watching him when he, um, so he's been used by, you know, like a guy or two already. He watched that at the beginning mm -hmm. and then he tries to kiss the foreign guy, um, mm -hmm. Mr. Pamuk. So right. I, can, I can never remember any names. I got that <laughs> one <laughs> finally. Um, well, and but... I, I always, I like when, uh, when, when Mr. Crowley finds out about, uh, Thomas and he's like, oh, we all had our time at Eaton or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. They're, they're more, more more open-minded than you think uh -huh. well <laughs> just I think wasn't allowed world, to be obviously official yeah. or talked about or anything kind of thing i think yeah. that's always been the case to yeah. some degree you know mm -hmm. there's just things that people didn't talk about but yeah. they still happened you know mm -hmm. so yeah so the last member of the staff which i was mr mosley uh played by kevin doyle and he's a pretty big character in the movie uh, and he's super awkward. And uh, when Matthew struggles having a valet, Mosley is his valet yeah. and he's awkward. And uh, that's when Robert has to tell Matthew, you know, that you're denying somebody of their livelihood. You're, you're just, yeah. and uh, that you need to do this. And, uh, so he's kind of a, a, a pretty fun character. Yep. I, I love Mr. Mosley. Yeah. Uh, he is another character who annoys me a lot of times, but that doesn't <laughs> mean I don't think he's fun. Yeah. Uh, I actually think he adds a lot of levity to the series that's needed. And he also gives just some, like, I don't feel like he furthers the, like, interests of the plot almost ever, you know, like he's, he's pretty much a side mm -hmm. character. Uh, but it, he does make it fun and his his connections with the different people in the staff um, are really end up being like I said they add levity to the yeah. series so yeah when it's great in the movie when he interrupts the queen yes <laughs> he's just mortified <laughs> <laughs> He's, it's, it's not them it's it's all of our servants who are here yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then he's like shaking <laughs> yeah <laughs> well let's talk a little bit about the movie so yeah. the movie came out in 2019 it had been i think a three-year break from the show to the movie and it's always a bit risky because it's a different dynamic making a movie versus making a show and mm -hmm. is it going to live up to the show or is it going to be disappointing for the fans? Uh, but I feel like this was a very strong uh, movie from, uh, the, I think this is a case where they did a very good job transitioning the, the show to a movie format. And if, if if like every couple of years we got a Downton Abbey movie, I wouldn't complain. I was just going to say that actually, <laughs> I, I really like the movie. Um, mm -hmm. What I like better about it is I feel like it can almost be a, something that you could, you could make a new movie every five years and watch how the world and how the family has changed each time, you know, which characters have died, what happened to them and the way that the, the story has evolved uh, throughout those years it could almost be like a little mini series. Yeah, I I know quite a few people who enjoyed the movie and they haven't even watched the show. Yeah. 
I I don't doubt that. I mm-hmm. think it's a it's a great movie. There's no reason why you couldn't watch it uh, ahead of time, or you couldn't watch it as a standalone. Uh, the problem is, I don't think you would feel the same connection, the same connections with the characters that you would have otherwise. But and there's some things that would be a little confusing. You know, things like the uh, the relationship between uh, Carson and the 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 rest of the staff and the like his role because he's kind of coming in uh, from a retirement uh that it's you you could understand it but you don't have the rich understanding of what's happening because you haven't watched the yeah. show yeah yeah like when he comes back in after you've already seen him retire and leave um yeah i was worried at the beginning i thought maybe they just weren't going to do anything with um with the new valet what's his name i can't think of his name now um oh yeah um the guy with the black hair and we just mm-hmm. talked about him but i can't think of his name you mean andy no not andy no he's a footman i think i forget no. Do, uh... anyway they, they he he replaces him so um oh, you at mean that thomas point, yeah, thomas, thomas is the tom oh because thomas is the butler oh okay but so, yeah, sorry, yeah. Butler. No problem. <laughs> um it's so bad at i forget who the, the valet role, but... is uh the they because they've economized just they don't have as many roles i'm sure yeah. somebody is the valet but by this point they've started to econ- to economize the roles and uh they have the king and queen coming for a visit this is uh-huh. a huge honor, but it turns out that uh, that they aren't actually able to really have them. Uh, it turns out they're not able to uh, to do the work for the the king and queen. That they have their own staff who come in and are very difficult. <laughs> this new staff, I, which I do think is a little bit funny. Um, mm-hmm. Watching the series just all together, there were so many things that didn't connect with me from the beginning because I I thought that it was like I was trying to put my own perception of the world onto the the series. Um, And the same thing happened initially with the movie, too, because I see all of these people and I'm like, dude, you don't have to work for like like a week here. You can just rest on your laurels. And let everybody else do what you want to do. Why are you not happy? Just like they say, go read a book, be happy about it. But they took so much pride in what they did. And as a, as a person in service, you know, that was your calling. It was what you did. It was the way that you worked. And I found that to be fascinating that, um, that there was this very different way of, of approaching, you know, like, your job and your your place of employment because if most people had a chance to take a week off of of vacation you know they just they would take a week off of vacation and allow someone else to do that 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 wouldn't be a problem you know but back then it would have been a different feeling for them but and there were some great lines between isabel and violet in the movie i love when she says that uh i mean when i well, I love when Violet says that Machiavelli is frequently underrated yes. and, and many qualities. And then Isabel says, so did Caligula. <laughs> Caligula, yeah. And you have Violet saying sarcasm. Not all of them are good. <laughs> yeah. And she says sarcasm is the lowest form of wit. <laughs> it's really good. Which I, I also- disagree with vehemently. I love sarcasm. <laughs> I also, I'm always surprised when you praise me, Isabel. And then she yeah. says, she says, I'm surprised I'm, to hear that I have. <laughs> to hear that I have, yeah. <laughs> so they did an incredible job. The two of them were so funny. Yeah. The only plot line that I really, I guess, didn't really love in the movie is uh, Princess Mary and her kind of abusive husband and the way that that all played out. I felt like they could have, the, the, the like the lesson was sort of oh he's gonna come around and i was just kind of like I, don't, I feel like that wasn't the most satisfying ending for that whole plot i i think it's a historically accurate ending 
for it, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Like, I, I think it really has to do with the way things were at the time. And that would have been the way people approached divorce, mm-hmm. you know, like it's not, it's not an option. You don't do it. And it, there's, <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't matter, especially since we're a Royal family, people will really look down on it. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that has more to do with, it's less of a moral statement than they're making than a, than a like historical statement about the way the world was at the time. Yeah. I mean, but this show is pretty escapist. I just would have liked a, I don't know, maybe some kind of different ending for that. But I, what do you think of Branson and Lucy in this? I, okay, so I, I was pretty interested in it. I was pretty wrapped up in it. Like, I I hope there's more. Um, I also hope there's more between Thomas and his little suitor that he meets at the end too. Like, Mm -hmm. I I liked both of those relationships and I liked seeing how they were possibly being fleshed out. Um, And also, again, having another baby, like, I... I think people had babies, you know, outside of wedlock frequently at the time, and you just didn't talk about it. You hid it, you hid it from the world, you know. I'm glad that that's not the case anymore, but to see that kind of thing being there and how um, they were trying to, like, make a step forward to to bring this, this child in, I, I don't know, like just all the way yeah. around it. Mm-hmm. Well, and what I really liked is by the end, because when Violet sees that Tom is interested in Lucy, all of a sudden she becomes a fan of that relationship because uh-huh. you know, this is the way to keep it all within the family. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, but they also were, Lucy was the baby, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Maud. Yeah. Of so, Maud. and so yeah. Violet is upset because she thinks she can't understand why Maud is giving her inheritance yeah. to this, uh, to, to, servant. to not to blood. But as yeah. soon as she finds out that, okay, it, it is blood. And yeah. then now here's the way with Tom that they can get. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was great. I, I did agree. I did like that. We'd like to take a second and thank our sponsor for this episode of the podcast. It's the Hallmarkies Merch Store. Are you looking for that perfect gift for the postable, hardy, or Hallmarkie in your life? What about getting that t-shirt or hoodie that will help you stand out at your next holiday party? Now is the time to check out the Hallmarkies Merch Store. Full of festive designs by artists like Jessica Miller, Carrie from Hallmark Comics, and more. You can even have more than just shirts, but totes, cell phone cases, notebooks, mugs, and more. And it isn't just Hallmark. We have designs for Anna Green Gables, Man from Snowy River, The Nanny, and more. Every purchase at the merch store goes to help support the podcast and allows us to make the great content you know and love. There are frequent sales, so go to tpublic.com slash stores slash Hallmarkies or see the link in the description. That's tpublic.com slash stores slash Hallmarkies. The thing I didn't like about the movie was the way that everything wrapped up it felt like it wrapped up very quickly in a neat little bow to me yeah and that didn't feel consistent with the movie or with the tv show i mean it seems like they would have left more things hanging i imagine they wanted it to be you know a standalone movie that could kind of wrap up the series and they weren't thinking they were it was going to be successful enough to do a second movie um yeah but that that was something where i i kind of was like feels like there should be something some loose thread somewhere that you're kind of wishing that they could pull that back together too yeah well and so we find out that violet is sick and so yeah. she's in this next movie that i thought loose... oh maybe she's not going to be in it but yeah. I, I don't know what they're going to do with that that is a loose thread i guess mm-hmm. i i can give you that 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 one I, and that was kind of heart-wrenching for me too that she you know opened up to lady mary about that and she's not telling anyone else because she doesn't want people to um assume she's just gonna die tomorrow you know i liked that that's very consistent with her character and uh then also that's when she has that kind of heart to heart with lady mary where she tells 
Lady Mary that like you'll be the one you'll be the old lady that will hold everything together and he says you're the best was... of me and that will that will live on yeah uh, I'll be fine until I'm not yeah mm-hmm. I liked that line too yeah um we also have uh Mary and Henry Talbot I love Matthew Good I think he's so dreamy and I liked him coming back from America and uh, them, you know, dancing and, and it seems like their relationship's in a pretty good spot that we're leaving them. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. And that's where Lady Mary to me throughout this entire movie, except for a little bit of hand wringing about her, um, uh, about the estate, other than right. that little bit of hand wringing there, um, I felt like she was very much softened and just in a happier place. I felt like last that we left her in the in the show, she felt more cynical. You know, like it felt like she was married to a man that she didn't really care to be married to, but it was more of a business transaction than it was a, like about a deep everlasting love. And uh, this felt like things had changed. And I, li- I liked that take. Yeah. yeah. Um, we also have uh, Branson the, the first there with at first they're a little bit suspect of, of him because of his Republican views. Yeah. It is different than our view of than what we know what Republican means to us now. Um, they just basically met somebody who wasn't in favor of the crown of the monarchy, yeah. anti-monarchist. And uh, so he has would, these views. He's like, like, uh, oh, what's a democracy? Like if, if you're yeah. in favor of democracy, it would mean that. Someone who's in favor of, of a republic. And that's why he's yeah, on the republic. republic. Yes. Yeah. yeah and, <laughs> uh, but it turns out, like I said, that he's not, uh, in, he's not against the visit and uh, yeah. and he supports the family and so he he's he's really good in this and, and he even defends the family like yeah. massively defends he's kind of kick family. butt yeah <laughs> <laughs> he really is uh, <laughs> and uh and then yeah i think we covered pretty much everything there's the thing with barrow uh getting arrested and uh, I, I really liked his dynamic with this guy, Ellis. Yeah. That was really the whole, well done. The whole peek into that forbidden part of the world, too, mm-hmm. at that time, I found fascinating. I'd like to know how much of that, like, like how widespread that kind of thing was at the time. Um, yeah. You know, I know, like, during Prohibition, you would have had, you know, like, speakeasies. Did you have, you know, like gay clubs where there were people, um, you know, hanging out and then to see it, that was another kind of loose thread that I was glad to see there too, how they didn't just wrap that up in like a happy little bow. There was, you know, the invasion of the police who came in and, you know, kept them from, uh, from still Mm -hmm. celebrating, but this guy came in and kind of smooth things over with the police for the sake of Thomas, you know, like I, I found that all really yeah, engaging. And interesting. It would be interesting to know they're in York when this happens. I, I don't know if sort of a, a middle level city would have that kind of thing or, you know, to have it frequently, or if you'd have to go to London, you know, for that uh-huh. kind of thing to, to have those, who knows? I have no idea. If that anybody listening knows, please too. let us, please let us know. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was it was interesting. Like I said, I just that that line at the end between the two of them, yeah, was really great. It just makes you think about the way the world has changed. Again, like mm-hmm. I've been on that kick this entire time. You know, like how much has the world changed, and how much we accept. And I'm not even talking like homosexuality. I'm talking like accepting like <laughs> you know people bettering themselves in a career and not leaving to be a secretary and still um and and that being a normal thing for for someone to change careers and go be a secretary and not feel stuck yeah well and and then even edith 
she talks about how she misses her, the career that she yeah. loved and just to spend all these time with people that she hates and that she doesn't think are interesting. And, but I think that also it's kind of, it's an interesting dynamic on the show because yes, we have more choices, it's the, but we also have the paradox of choice that, that we have more choices and the freedoms, of course, we're grateful for, and we wouldn't want to go back. But then again, it, there's something kind of comforting about the rules of yeah. this time and that you knew what your options were you knew what choices you had you knew what life that you were supposed to live yeah. and so which is it, on one time on one hand kind of confining obviously but on the other hand especially if you're in a marginalized you know yeah. group but on the other hand there's something kind of nice about that that yeah. we they lost in Lindsay Ellis's uh, Titanic video, she touches on this show just a little bit, but she said something about um, it's all it's always oversimplification to say that um, there's any kind of uh, that that things that life was a simpler time or that things were better. It was the good old days, you know. But it did feel kind of like it was a simpler time. You didn't have as many uh, things that made life more complicated yeah. like we have today I mean, you know? like i said so. the the paradox of choice so we think that say you get offered chicken or fish those are your two options and you pick one or the other and then you're you're probably happy with one or the other and and so we think oh well if we got a cheesecake factory menu have all of these choices are we going to be <laughs> <Yeah>. happier <laughs> Usually not because not, now no. all of a sudden we're looking at all this stuff where we could have been perfectly happy with the chicken or the fish. And now we have all of these things of, of, to pick from and uh, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was maybe a simpler time, but it also wasn't easy or good for yeah. a lot of different groups of people, you yeah. know, so, yeah. but it, it is still a fascinating look into, you know, the, the like last part of the aristocracy at that time so well i i really enjoyed the movie i forget what i gave it in my review but definitely went fresh on it um uh, what would you uh, give it like out of 10 out of 10 see i i like to rank it up against other things so uh -huh. um i think i would give it out of 10 probably an eight. I felt like the ending was a little bit too quickly, uh, you know, wrapped up, but I, I would probably give it an eight, maybe okay. a seven, but probably an eight. Yeah. It was engaging all the way through. And I felt like the cinematography was beautiful and was kicked up a notch from the television program. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. That. Yeah, yeah, I would also give it an eight. I think it was really a fun movie. Uh, so we'll see what the new one uh yeah. if they if they're able to give an eight as well uh but if you're a Downton Abbey fan you're listening please let us know what you think of the show and the movie and all the different characters that we talked about would love to hear your thoughts and uh Trent where can people find you yeah you can find me at not your normal guy uh well at not your normal guy on uh YouTube uh it's actually not your normal guy theme parks or you can find me at not your normal g1 on Instagram Twitter TikTok but I don't do anything on tiktok but yeah you can find me great. at those places great and you can find me at rachel's reviews all of our social media itunes youtube and on rotten tomatoes so check that out also make sure you're following the podcast at homework's pod and homework's podcast all of our social media and if you are listening on itunes please leave us your ratings and reviews that helps so much and if you are watching on youtube please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel we appreciate that so much we also have our patreon group and merch store and take a look at that and thanks again trent this was really fun i i thoroughly enjoyed talking about down happy with you so i loved you. it too thanks <laughs> for having me on it's so good to talk to you again too rachel and we'll see y'all later bye everyone bye